come to order. Will the clerk please take attendance? Chair Neely? Here. Representatives Farhat? Here. Rixie? Here. Carter? Here. Whitsett? Grant? Here. Price? Here. Van Workham? Here. Markinen? Here. Outman? Here. Tisdale? Here. Hoadley? Here. Madam Chair, you have a quorum? Thank you. Vice Chair of Van. Vice Chair Ferhat, we make a motion to adopt the minutes from May 11, 2023 meeting. Without any objections, the meetings, the minutes are adopted. For today's agenda, we will have vote on HB 4068, Rep. Hood, following the vote on the H1 uh, substitute on the bill and testimony on HB 4717, Rep. Uh, Vandewa and uh, 4318 Rep. Neely following the vote on the H1 substitute for HB 4317. Representative Farhag offered a substitute on H1 for House Bill 4068. Would you like to speak to the bill? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so for uh, the substitute for 40, 4068, 4068, uh, it simply strikes the reference to blood drive. Um, and lines eight and nine, just to simplify uh, the administration of the of the tax credit um, and making it easier for folks to qualify. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please call the vote to adopt the substitute. On the motion to adopt the substitute, Chair Neely? Yes. Representatives Farhat? Yes. Brixie? Yes. Carter? Yes. Whitsett? Grant? Yes. Price? Yes. Van Workham? Yes. Markinen? Yes. Outman? Yes. Tisdale? Yes. Oldly? Yes. Madam Chair, you have 11 yeas, 0 nays, 0 pass. The substitute is adopted. Thank you. Representative Price makes a motion to report HB 4068 with H1. Mr. Clerk, please take the vote. On the motion to report, Chair Neely? Yes. Representatives Farhat? Yes. Rixie? Uh, yes. Carter? Yes. Whitsett? Grant? Yes. Price? Yes. Van Workham? Yes. Markinen? No. Outman? Yes. Tisdale? Yes. Oldley? Yes. Madam Chair, you have 10 yeas, 1 nay, 0 pass. HB 4068, report the recommendation, substitute each one. Thank you. Now we would take up testimony on HB 4317, Rep. Vendawa, and House Bill 4318, Neely. Here to give testimony on House Bill 4317 and 18 is Amanda. The chair will go at ease. All right, the committee will come to order. Uh, Representative Neely, Representative Vanderwell, please uh, begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, members of the committee. We appreciate the opportunity to be here. House Bills 43, 17, and 18 are a result of almost two years of work group meetings between representatives of the energy companies, local government, the Department of Treasury, and the energy economy supporters. Throughout this time, the group has production, had production conversation work together towards creating a solar energy facility tax that is predictable for taxpayers and taxing authorities. The problem faced with Michigan communities was unpredictable tax revenue from large-scale commercial solar projects. We have seen litigation and fighting in the past over how to calculate these tax payments. These bills offer a solution they establish the framework of local governments to enter into a PILT or payment in lieu of tax with solar projects at a set price. The bill creates the structure for how these contracts will operate in short. The bills will allow an owner of a solar facility to file an application for a solar exemption certificate, create a solar energy facility tax that is levied on the project, lays out the process for them to apply for this certification, certification, 
in steps that locals must take to consider it and amends the General Property Tax Act to exempt the project from being assessed personal property tax. This process is totally optional. If the developer or solar company doesn't wish to pursue this, then they don't have to if the locals don't want it. Then they may deny the project. These bills create a solid framework that will help the and further develop of solar energy production in Michigan while creating a standard taxation structure that is acceptable for companies as well as the local government. Thank you again for your consideration and I ask for your support and I will turn it over to the chair. Thank you. Hello and thank you. I will be speaking on House Bill 4318. I want to say thank you to Van Vanderwall for these, uh, this bill package. I'm ex so excited to be here today. As you know, this is one of my favorite committees. <laughs> <laughs> I will start by saying it is clear that Michigan is becoming a powerhouse for technology advances, electronic uh, vehicles and battery plants. And as a legislator, it is important to find ways to encourage and support green alternatives throughout the state, and this legislation does that. My bill would arm the General Property Tax Act, Public Act 206, instead of uh, charging the, the traditional tax calculation on certain property assets. This bill looks to alleviate the tax burden on qualified solar energy facilities and will calculate a payment in lieu of the traditional calculation taxes. In layman's turn, this bill will look at the amount of energy produced by the qualified solar energy facilities and based on that particular amount of energy, set an appropriate level of contribution. This legislation is consistent with the needs for our state to continue to move forward and to become a carbon neutral. This bill will help encourage solar districts by easing potential uh, I'm sorry, by easing partial the tax burden for their operation while ensuring they are still paying reasonable share of their dues. This bill is truly a step towards our future, encouraging further momentum towards environmentally friendly alternative and future legislation that moves this proper priority forward. Thank you so much for your time. Committee ladies. Now we have a question by my Minority Chair Vice uh, Dan Workham. Thank you, Madam Chair. And this could be either to the chairwoman or the good representative. Uh, where did the magic sauce of seven thousand dollars per megawatt nameplate come from? Where Where is that? Where you say there's two years worth of task force? Yep. How actually, we get to that number. I give you a little bit of brief history. It actually started already. Um, two terms prior, or last term, the term prior, and uh, we sat down, it wasn't agreed upon, and the first time last year we went into uh, uh, lengthy discussions with uh, all parties, um, the locals, uh, counties, and uh, the energy folks, and we, we really narrowed down what what is uh, the, the fair price that each one would receive and each one would pay. And after a lot of negotiation uh, back and forth, that's the, the number we, we landed on. Does that take in consideration the amount of acreage or plot of land that requires to produce that amount of capacity? Yep, the charge was uh, developed on a per megawatt uh, production. So if a facility is a 10 meg, it would pay that per megawatt it uh, and of course that takes into effect uh, 
the size and the acreage of uh, what it takes to do that. Next, we have uh, Rep. Tisdale. Thank you, Chair Neely. Um, thank you, Representative Vanderwall, for bringing this in today. A couple of questions, real quickly. Um, page 35 of the My Healthy Climate Plan, consumers is planning on 8,000 megawatts built by 2040, uh, submitted by Ms. Uh, Hutton today from DTE. Uh, they're committed to 15,000 uh, megawatts of, of solar by, by uh, the same date. So that's, that's 23,000 megawatts installed nameplate capacity. Do we know how much, how much land are we, are we talking about and what is the taxable value of the installed equipment? Well, that's the, that's the biggest reason for this. I can't tell you how many acres of land that's going to have to take. You're going to have to ask the professional uh, that's proposing the 15,000 megawatts. But what it really is is it, it's a taxation on what we've done with, with wind and really trying to make sure that we don't put our communities in the same situation they are now where you start looking at the price to install a system like this and then the property tax saying, hey, it's like that car that you drove off the parking lot. It's no <coughs> longer worth that. And then the dispute on what that true taxable value is. This is a protection that gives our locals an opportunity to know a, a solid tax base for an extended period of time, um, a fair tax base, and that we know that we're going to keep our, our locals out of court, and we know that it's uh, the, in the best interest of expansion, development, and making sure that all people are protected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No other questions? N one more. One more, okay. From uh, Rep. Britsey. So um, I am just guessing that not all, all locals are going to share um, the idea that, uh, that the continuity of PILT is good for their community when it's so drastically less than, um, you know, what, what they would have been getting for the personal property before. Uh, one of my communities is in a position where um, the solar um, equipment uh, is uh, taxable, but the um, land is not. And uh, they only have, they would, um, their revenue would be less than 50% of what it is today uh, under, the, under the plan. And um, the, the tax abatement that they granted was a 10-year abatement, which means that dollar amount they're receiving today will go up in 10 years. But under uh, the PILT plan, it's a 20-year um, greatly reduced plan. So I'm, I'm, I have some concerns about the fiscal impact um, to communities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we, when we make these sweeping changes, um, it does have an impact on communities who are uh, using their tax, tax revenue to um, provide services like police and fire. Um, how did you come up with that dollar amount? Well, I think two things, and, and it gets back to uh, Representative Van Workham's question, but we got to remember first part is they do not have to enter into this agreement. They have the choice. They can either choose to do it or they can not do that. But the dollar amount was, and remember, it's a 20-year payment that will be consistent over a 20-year period, and you must understand when you put in in personal property tax, there's a, there's a huge spike in the beginning, and it drops off relatively quickly. And I would have to look at the numbers of the community you're speaking on to see that if that period of time would be more or less. 
But what we're trying to do is put a safety net in. I know that my part of the reason why I came up with these these bills several years ago is my my home county had been in court for years. And I will tell you, no matter what it is, for the years that we were in court, we lost all that tax revenue. It was settled, and those dollars and our lawyer fees have been absorbed, and it's going to take years and years to recoup this. This is actually a protection that's put in place that we know it's consistent, but we also know that the communities can either choose to do that or opt out. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have one more question. Rep. <laughs> Ottman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative, for being here. Um, I, I understand the intent of the legislation. It's something that greatly affects my district. Uh, like yours, I believe, my, uh, a, a great portion of my district was wrapped up in, in these legal lawsuit battles uh, over wind energy. And uh, it's something that's it's greatly affected uh, my community. Um, it, it just uh, it frustrates me a little bit because we have a certain parts of the state that are really dictating this renewable energy agenda, uh, you know, Lansing in particular, and then our rural districts get stuck with all the infrastructure in place. And um, in, in terms of solar, we're taking up prime fertile ag ground. Uh, I, I think we need to really consider that moving forward. But my main question is, do you think this is enough of incentives for locals to opt into to this program? Thank you for the question, and I appreciate it, Rep. Outman. I, I will agree with you. Uh, I think we need to discuss, and that's another bill for another time, is right. the, the ground that's being taken up. But I think we need to look at where technology is going and what, what we're seeing. I do believe that these numbers are adequate in lines of making locals take a look at that if they want to bring it in. And again, if they, if they feel strongly that they can do better on the outside, they yep. can opt out of this program. But the concern is we understand personal property tax. We've seen this in several options, not just when. We've seen it in hmm. large box stores and et cetera. And that is the reason why I brought it for. Sure. Forward. And I understand. I like that it's a choice. You can opt in or you can continue on with the existing depreciation schedule that's in place right now. What is it currently? What is what? The depreciation schedule for these. Oh, the, yeah. you know what? I'm going to have to defer that. Uh, I once knew better than I do today, but it's yeah. been several years since I looked at that. I would have to you know, look that number up. I can get that for you. Yeah, though. I would. I'd be curious to take a look at that because, sure. uh, in terms, and it of, may be discussed here shortly. But sure, yeah, because in terms of the the uh, the wind turbine tax depreciation schedule, I never really understood that. I mean, they depreciate f out fully at eight years when they have a thirty year uh, lifespan. It just made no sense to me. <clears throat> I thought it was excuse me extremely unfair to to locals who felt like it was kind of a bait and switch tactic. Uh, when these are, or projects were originally proposed. So um, I'd be curious to take a look at that. Uh, yeah, the original I'd be glad to one. provide that. And again, as I said, this is an alternative to what the, the model's been. And I believe yeah. we need to make sure that our locals are taken care of. And uh, we've worked uh, very hard on these issues a, a lot of hours. Yeah. And uh, we feel very strongly that this gives them a solid option, that they'll know that they'll have an extended period of consistent income without that depreciation. Yeah, well, I appreciate all your efforts on this, and really everybody that was involved in these work groups. It's uh, I know it's a heavy lift, and um, you know, thank you for bringing this forward. Absolutely. Thank you, Rep. We appreciate you taking all those questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Appreciate the opportunity to testify here today. You have a great day. You too. Next, we will have uh, Amanda Stalin. She's on Zoom, and she's from the National Grid Renewable. And we also we have Ed Rivet from uh, the executive director from the Michigan uh, Conservation Energy Forum, representing from Michigan Chamber. You can come up too. Ed. Ed, is Ed here?
Okay, we'll just let Amanda and then we'll call you up shortly. All right, Amanda, whenever you're ready. Thank you, ma'am. Good afternoon, Chair Neely, Vice Chair Storhout and Van Workham, and to the esteemed members of the House Committee on Tax Policy. My name is Amanda Stalling, Senior Regulatory Manager for National Grid Renewables, and I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to meet with you virtually today. Unfortunately, I'm in Kentucky. I couldn't join you in person, uh, but did want to reach out and voice our support for the proposed payment in lieu of tax program, or PILT, uh, the legislation that's before the committee today. So a little bit about National Grid Renewables. We are a leading North American renewable energy company based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We have just over 2,000 megawatts of uh, solar, wind, and battery projects either under construction uh, or in operation across the U.S. Some of you may be familiar with our Bingham Solar Facility in St. John's or perhaps our Temperance Solar Project in Erie. Those are both 20 megawatt projects uh, that are doing very well in those communities. As a farmer-friendly and community-focused company, National Grid Renewables develops projects for corporations and utilities that seek to repower America's electricity grid by reigniting local economies and reinvesting in a sustainable future. We are part of the competitive unregulated ventures division of National Grid and are one of a few development companies that also own and operate many of the projects uh, that we have developed. I like to tell people that for the most part uh, with our projects, when we talk the talk, we walk the walk. Certainty is certainly critical to the success of our projects and necessary for strong economic development in the state. Business, uh, businesses, solar developers work diligently to de-risk a project for every stage of its life cycle from the time we start signing up land uh, to the time that project goes into operation and starts generating electricity. Our customers and investors need to understand how we determine certain prices and costs that will affect that project even up to and including decommissioning of that facility. So it's not just while it's in operation, it's also uh, the financial and modeling that we use to determine how much it's going to cost to remove that facility from the land. As an unregulated independent power producer, our ultimate success largely depends on our ability to predict the financial impacts of each project so we can fully account for and disclose those costs to potential buyers when we're uh, negotiating power purchase agreements. National Grid Renewables supports and appreciates the efforts taken by Chair Neely and Representative Vanderwall to provide for some assurances in the solar energy industry. If enacted, House Bills 4317 and 4318 will serve as an incentive to solar developers seeking to do business in the state. This voluntary uh, PILT program will also provide local units of government the long-term confidence they need to adequately pay and for and allocate funds to services that benefit the community. The PILT legislation before you today was created through months of stakeholder meetings and countless hours of collaboration with industry professionals, key trade associations, local units of government, and public officials. We believe this long-term collaborative effort has led to a workable solution for a voluntary tax structure that is able to provide the increased financial certainty renewable energy companies are looking for when they seek to do business in the state such as yours. National Grid Renewables continues our support of PILT for the state of Michigan, and we are available to answer any questions regarding the potential impact of this legislation uh, as it will have uh, on the effects of development in the state of Michigan as well as our portfolio. Thank you again for the opportunity to voice our support for the PILT legislation and I look forward to answering any questions that uh, the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We do have one question from Rep. Um, Tisdale. Uh, thank you, Chair Neely and Amanda. Thank you. Just a, just a quick question similar to what I asked um, um, uh, earlier. So you're, you have hands-on experience running a 20-megawatt facility that, that you indicated is going quite well. What, how much land mass does that occupy and what is the value of the installed equipment? That, that project, uh, one of the projects I believe is on, and I have to go back and double check, I believe it's on approximately uh, 220 acres. I'm unsure of the value. I do not have that information in front of me. 
uh, but I'd be happy to obtain that information and send it to the committee. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Sam, there's any, not any more questions for you. Thank you today for um, testifying. We appreciate you taking your time out of your busy day to lend um, your voice. Thank you so much. It was my pleasure, Chair. Thank you so much. Next, we have Ed Rivett from Michigan's Conservative Energy. Thank you for being here today, and you can begin whenever you're ready. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee, for this opportunity to testify in support of uh, House Bills 43, 17, and 18. Uh, as Rep. Vanderwall said, this is our third session, third, third run up the hill uh, with this legislation, and MICEF uh, has been very invested in this process, primarily because we are the only organization in Michigan that has a program and a team exclusively dedicated to the mission of working with local communities to site large-scale wind and solar projects. So I have a team. That's all we do uh, in that particular work. We're in our fifth year of working with local planning commissions, county and township boards, uh, community members, renewable energy companies like we just heard, and the utilities to craft ordinances and to get projects permitted. We're currently working on projects from the western end of the UP and Rep. Markinen's district to the entire breadth of our southern border. These bills are extremely important uh, for some of the very reasons that Rep. Vanderwall stated, to provide certainty, to provide uniformity, uh, and to provide simplicity in the taxing process. As we have worked in all of these communities, the complicated depreciation tables and trying to be able to project what those revenues might be over 20 plus years really complicates the local discussion process. And so bringing in that certainty of what it's going to be and that uniformity uh, would greatly help your locals sort through those issues. There's plenty to sort through. It's a complicated process. I myself am a planning commission member in my township uh, here in southern uh, Ingham County. Uh, what's important also about the uniformity is that these companies might have a project that literally straddles two townships and you could have assessors in two townships come up with two different taxation assessments. So it would also create uniformity or if they're working in one county uh, in this part of the state and they go to another county to put in a project, they can anticipate the same taxation. So there are tremendous advantages to their process uh, as the developers, and then working with the communities so that there is, again, that certainty and predictability. Uh, that will eliminate the bait and switch concern that you raise, Representative Outman, uh, which is a primary concern for us. As we're working in these conversations, they're like, well, help us understand what this is going to mean for tax revenues. Uh, and I'll add, Representative Brixey, to your question. Um, Primarily, the land that we're looking at in the large projects is agricultural land, which is often taxed uh, under PA 116. It's reduced, or overall, it will certainly bring in less revenue as agricultural land than if it's improved with the solar. So every community will see a substantial increase in their overall revenues, regardless of which structure they choose, they, compared to the, the way the land is taxed today. So it will certainly be a tax revenue uh, benefit to the community if they choose to bring the solar project in. Um, so those are some of the important reasons um, to, to bring this forward and to help the, uh, the siting process and to decomplicate it on behalf of your locals. If you want to love your local governments like your local planning commission members, then this is a great advantage to them. Uh, the last thing I will uh, add in just response to your questions, Rep. Tisdale, about how much land we would need to reach some of the goals that our utilities uh, have put forward. Um, on the calculations that I've seen and, and having worked on these projects, what I can tell you is that all of the solar that's planned will probably need less than half of all the land that we currently have in corn production for ethanol to go into our gas tanks, which is about 750,000 acres total across the state for ethanol production. And since last week, my organization co-hosted an EV day here at the Capitol, we're going to need less and less ethanol over time. That land will have to be put into some other production. We certainly think farmers, if they can grow corn for ethanol to power our vehicles today, 
we'd love to see them have the opportunity to put some of that land into production to produce eth to electrons that will fuel our cars in the future. So they already grow fuel. We might just change which fuel they use. And so these land use considerations are going to be important as we go forward in the conversation. But a simplified, uniform tax system will help us get there much more readily with a lot less consternation in local communities. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. We have uh, Rep. Brixey. Okay, Mr. Rivet, I'll bite. How is it that this is something that our planning commissions will like? Well, uh, Please because explain when, <laughs> how a pill to something a planning commission likes. Well, because when you go through the process in most communities don't have a detailed ordinance on solar. And our township just went through this about 18 months ago because we have a 20 megawatt project very similar to the one that was discussed earlier coming into Aurelius Township in our district, your yep. district of mine. Um, so when we went through that lengthy process, we, we had no solar ordinance. And so now we have a very involved solar ordinance process. So to talk about the setbacks and, and all of the other elements, when we then make a recommendation to the township board who has to vote on these things, including the ordinance, and they say, well, what are the impacts this project is going to have? A big one is, well, how are we going to tax it and how much money is it going to generate? Um, when we start talking about the tax tables and depreciations and so forth, that's a lot less, it's a, it's a little less predictable. Um, and more importantly, the history of the wind turbine problem that Representative Vanderwall outlined has allowed, quite frankly, opponents of solar projects to come in and scream bait and switch. And therefore, it puts pressure on the local officials to feel like, well, how can I tell my community I'm doing something wise for them and will have a predictable revenue when we've seen the reverse happen with the wind turbine experience? So by helping them Locals say, this is how much we're going to get every year for the next 20 years. It's written in stone, basically. That takes that part off the table, and all the other controversial elements <laughs> uh, still stay on the table. So that's how it helps us a great deal. Okay. I, I uh, uh, thank you for that explanation for, um, you know, I've, I've served as a planning commissioner. I've ser served as a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals. I've served as a township trustee, as township treasurer, and I was confused <laughs> as to where that would be coming from because, in general, uh, payment of in lieu of taxes is something that is done at at the board or council level, not at the planning commission right. level. So I I see your link there, your nexus. Uh, I might I might not agree with it. Well, <laughs> with and that, I certainly are speaking certainly on behalf of the of the boards as well. It, uh, most certainly on behalf of the township boards or the county boards as well as their planning commissions. Yes. Yeah, so um, the. Uh, are we are we going to be hearing from um, Treasury and are we going to be hearing from they're Treasury? For they're questions they're about testimony. Oh, they're not going to. Okay, I have some questions for uh, Treasury. So thank you very much. Since there are no other questions, thank you so much. Next, we will have um, Brian from Consumer Energy and Sarah from DT Energy. If you guys can come up. And welcome to tax policy. Whenever you guys are ready, you can start. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairman Neely, or I'm sorry, uh, Chairwoman Neely, um, Vice Chairs Farhat and uh, Van Workum, uh, members of the House Tax Policy Committee. Uh, my name is Brian Van Blarkham. I'm the Director of Tax for Consumers Energy. Consumers, en Consumers Energy has proudly been serving Michigan's progress for more than 135 years. And as Michigan navigates a clean energy transformation, our tax policies need to be creative and innovative while also preserving um, the traditions and the basic principles that have always made Michigan great. 
And with that in mind, uh, our company is uh, testifying in support of House Bills 4317 and 4318. So these bills create a new solar property tax framework that doesn't exist today. Michigan's traditional property tax system, the General Property Tax Act, requires the annual valuation of property at its true cash value or market value. And with new technologies such as wind and solar, we've learned that that can be a very difficult and sometimes contentious valuation exercise. When disagreements over valuations occur, we uh, very quickly constrain the relationships between owners and our, and our, and our host communities. And with a goal of investing in 8,000 megawatts of competitively priced solar here in the state of Michigan, our company believes that these bills give communities and developers an alternative tool to partner in Michigan's clean energy transformation. Now this, uh, I think you've heard today, this legislation didn't come about overnight. Um, it's, a, it's a product of many hours and iterations reflecting the, con the concerns and the expertise of a, of a very diverse group of stakeholders. First, we appreciate the State Tax Commission and the work done by their ad hoc committee on solar to, to produce a very transparent report on the valuation of solar here in the state of Michigan. We appreciate the time, the effort, and the leadership from representatives from the governor's office, the Michigan Department of Treasury, our local governmental groups, and other solar developers who really shaped the policies behind this legislation. And finally, to uh, Representative Neely and Representative Vanderwall for sponsoring these bills <clears throat> and recognizing their importance to developers and communities alike. So what, is, what does this legislation do? I think you've heard a lot of it today already, but it creates certainty by providing an annual $7,000 per megawatt payment in lieu of tax over 20 years so that communities and developers can, uh, can effectively manage their budgets, their revenue and expense budgets here in the future. It provides optionality, so optionality first for a developer to apply for the PILT structure and also to the local unit of government to either approve or disapprove the PILT as an alternative to uh, the traditional taxation system. It includes a transparent application process that gives our local units of government the time, the information, and the funding needed to make an informed decision about the investment coming to their community. And it addresses land use concerns by incentivizing solar development in non-traditional areas of the state with a $2,000 per megawatt uh, annual payment for projects located in brownfields opportunity zones, and uh, land owned by the state of Michigan. It also grants uh, broad oversight to, the, to our state tax commission to, to issue the, uh, the forms and the instructions and the guidance that's needed to administer the program. And it also addresses a handful of uh, kind of just general policy concerns that all of our uh, stakeholders thought were important, such as um, transfer of a certificate if a facility is sold. There's a provision for uh, revocation and recapture if for some reason a developer doesn't pay the specific tax. And we've even included a provision that uh, provides for a payment um, when a project is under construction. And last, it, it sunsets. It sunsets for new projects after December 31st, 2031 providing the legislature a date certain opportunity to kind of step back and evaluate the goals and objectives of the program. So I want to thank you uh, today for the time to, to testify. Uh, our company believes that the development of these bills over the last two years was very thoughtful and innovative and balanced to ensure that we keep Michigan energy costs competitive. We create energy jobs and solar investments across the state. And we also provide um, an adequate amount of revenue to our local uh, host communities who provide a lot of valuable services. And with that, I will turn it over to Sarah. Okay. Well, Brian did a very good job, I think, of summarizing some of the key terms, but 
you know, I would like to just continue and say, you know, good afternoon, Chairwoman Neely and Vice Chairs Farhat, Farhat and Van Workham and members of the Michigan House Committee on Tax Policy. My name is Sarah Hutton and I am Tax Counsel and Manager of Tax Planning at DT Energy. And I also appreciate the opportunity to testify today in support of House Bills 4317 and 4318. Uh, during my testimony, I'll focus on two points that have been addressed already, but I think are really important. And that is why this policy is necessary for the state of Michigan, local communities, and developers such as DTE, as well as highlight two key elements of this legislation that really highlight DTE's support. So let me begin with just why we believe the policy is necessary. You know, since 2009, DT has invested $3 billion in renewables in today's Michigan's largest producer of solar and wind energy. To continue our transition to cleaner energy, we plan to double our investment in renewables by 2025 and eventually have more than 60% of our total generation mix come from solar and wind. As mentioned, you know, our proposed integrated resource plan, which outlines this transition, does highlight that we're adding more than 15,000 megawatts of renewables. To complete this transition, it is, is paramount that the state of Michigan and its solar, solar developers, such as DT, maintain strong, strong partnerships with local communities and their residents. House Bills 4317 and 4318 help strengthen these partnerships by specifically providing the desired certainty and predictability for both local communities and developers, which you know, does allow us to remove potential barriers to the future development of solar energy and um, help the local communities receive the, the property taxes that they're anticipating for their budget. Two, a second element of the legislation that we really find important is, as mentioned, is the optionality. So this legislation, it gives the, both the solar developer as the local, as well as the local host committee, the opportunity to agree to the payment in lieu of taxes. Solar developers have the option to submit a PILT application, while local communities also have the option to accept or deny the solar developer's application. If a community and developer do not agree to the PILT, that the solar assets will be simply taxed under the traditional ad valorem structure. Second, this legislation is the result of a robust stakeholder engagement process developed through extensive conversations with local units of government, Treasury, the Governor's Office, Solar Trade Associations, utilities throughout work groups held in, ooh, excuse me, in 2021 and 2022. Through these work groups, the various stakeholders developed the PILT terms laid out in this legislation, including the statutorily predetermined fixed amount, the fixed term, the application and re revocation processes, and specific incentivized provisions for the development of solar and obsolete or blighted areas. The collaborative process plus optionality results in a policy that DT believes is a responsible and necessary step forward for Michigan and one that will aid communities and solar developers alike in a fair and equitable way. We urge your support of this legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for the opportunity to speak for, before you today. We welcome any questions. Thank you. We have one question, um, Rep. Britsey. Hi. Um, thank you for your testimony. I'm trying, and I, I'm sorry, I have a lot of questions. I'm a former treasurer and I kind of really hated pilts. I'm I'm sorry. They were, I found them to be um, really a pain to administer, and we didn't always get our money. And um, I I did not like them, and so I'm concerned on behalf of the locals. So I'm I'm sorry in advance for my questions because I'm I I don't. Did this even come to committee last year? I don't. In the Senate. I do, okay, so I'm not imagining things. Like, I'm un, unfamiliar with the bills. So I'm just going to apologize in advance for how many questions I have. Um, you know, we, we, I've heard from my colleagues um, in the northern uh, and more rural areas about um, uh, one of the drivers for this is uh, staying out of court and the certainty. Um, are you, how, how many units are you in court with over your current installations? Um, so 
Consumers Energy had uh, some wind litigation that went back to uh, 2000, uh, 2014. Uh, it impacted um, two projects that we had in two counties, um, so Mason County and Tuscola County. And uh, the Mason County project, that litigation was ended, uh, I believe, in 2018. And uh, we're kind of happy to announce that we have uh, are just recently um, settling the cases in our Tuscola uh, community. And so, but those are cases that you, you initiated where you're you're the ones taking the local unit to court, correct? We, we did initiate the, the appeals there. And were those cases where they followed the depreciation tables? The, the state tax commission depreciation tables were not followed in those uh, cases. Were not followed, correct. okay. So um, how many solar cases do you have? Uh, we, it, at this time, we don't have any, no solar, any solar cases. cases. Okay, um, and this is this is just this is just solar. The pilt. The right? the pilt as it's structured is just for solar. And so the the argument that that my colleague was making that this will help everyone stay out of court means that it will help prevent the owners of the solar installations from suing the local units of government in or appealing them in the tax tribunal, right? Which you have to, which a local unit of government has to defend with attorneys. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, there is uncertainty um, about how and at what value a facility will be uh, valued 10, 15, 20 years into the future. So the solar pilt is a, you know, it's an alternative tool that the, the developer and the community can use to uh, avoid the issue, the issues that come along with having to value property. And it just, it simply provides that certainty that, you know, if, um, if, if the structure, if the pilt structure is put in place that uh, the, the project will pay the, the 7000 or whatever the specified am amount is over the course of that 20-year period. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you guys for coming and testifying today. Oh, I'm sorry. We have a couple more questions. I apologize. Um, Rep. Van Wacken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Two quick questions. Uh, you've mentioned and seen your testimony uh, potential land owned by the state of Michigan. Is there anything that is outlined or could you give me what those parameters might be or what type of land you would be looking at? And um, do you, um, is there a reason for the sunset in the, the bill? Were you part of the discussions related to the sunset and what impact would that have? Um. <clears throat> I'm sorry, uh, the, for the first state of, state of Michigan land. Yeah, sorry. Um, I, I think the, I mean, that was actually a, a, a provision that uh, stakeholders had brought to the group. And I think the thought there was is that uh, in some cases, the, the DNR or different uh, uh, departments within the state of Michigan could have excess land that um, could, could be used to um, host a, a solar facility, either um, either as a project that would serve one of their uh, buildings, so to offset their usage, or also to, um, you know, feed um, energy into the grid. And uh, so the second sunset, sunset. yeah. Um, I, I think the th the thought there was, you know, we we wanted uh, the stakeholders wanted at some point in the future where uh, there would be a pause and the the legislature could. Uh, step back and analyze the the success of the program, whether the goals and objectives uh, were met. Would that sunset, uh, would, I believe it's within less than 20 years, would that impact any of the contracts that have been signed or uh, those be grandfathered in? No, it uh, it's the sunset is only applicable to projects being placed in service either before or after that sunset date. But to the extent a project uh, qualifies for the PILT, uh, before December 31st, 2031, 
it would be it would be responsible for making that payment over that the twenty year period. Uh, Chair, Chairwoman Neely, we do we also I know a few questions have been posed about how we arrived at the seven thousand dollar megawatt, and I think Brian and I are probably two of the best people to answer that those questions. Um, just for a little bit of reference, when you asked about the wind litigation, so in a lot of those communities, the local communities used a table other than the STC table. And so we learned from the mistakes of kind of the wind litigation. The STC in 2021 put together a very large scale work group that consisted of Treasury, the department, you know, uh, governor's office, a lot of the local communities, um, DT consumers. And we, everyone was, uh, asked to submit information on how to value solar assets. And this was for the purpose of the traditional ad valorem structure. And so the, a very large work group was you know, conducted by the STC and they actually issued uh, a solar table in 2021, I believe 2021, fall of 2021, um, that's used for a traditional ad valorem structure. When we were looking at how to calculate the PILT amount, which was part of you know, the smaller subgroup that was used for the solar PILT, we took that table and we said, okay, if we were to convert this table into a number, what would that look like? And it's not only converting that table, but it's also saying, okay, hey, what's the term we want to use? So there is discussion about we, whether we want a 10-year term, a 20-year term, a 30-year term, because those economics all kind of correlate together. And and really that's how we arrived at the $7,000, is by taking those two pieces of information, the table that was issued by the STC for ad valorem, and then connecting it in with the agreed upon term, which again was part of the collaborative process. It was not one-sided, it was, hey, what would work best for everyone? What would provide that certainty, predictability, but also understanding that there is a life to these assets and when will we remove them? Um, and so that's really how we arrived at that number, just to help clarify. Okay, thank you. And because of the time, we're, we're going to hold off on the questions. I promise I will let you get your question. I still have five more people that we need to um, have testimony, and we're going to limit those to like two to three minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Next, we will have Dr. Sherman, Lauren Sherman from Michigan Energy and Innovation Business Council. You may come up. Thank you, Chair Neely, for the opportunity to testify quickly. Um, my name is Laura Sherman. I'm the president of the Michigan Energy Innovation Business Council. We're a trade organization. We have about 160 members across the state of Michigan. About Excuse me. Uh, can we have respect for our, our, our speaker here today? Please, colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. More than 20 of those members are in the utility scale solar development business, including National Grid Renewables, who you heard from earlier today. We are strongly supportive of House Bills 4317 and 4318. I was a part of the work group that um, folks have talked about already and, and spent countless hours negotiating this. Of all the folks at the table in that work group, I think all the concerns were listened to and fairly addressed. And I think that was really important to us that everybody had a voice and was listened to. Michigan EIBC members understand that partnerships with local communities are really critical to the successful siting of renewable projects. And those developers really spend hours in those communities talking with people and discussing issues of concern with landowners and local elected officials. And as you've heard today, tax policy is a really key part of that discussion. So for solar projects, um, as many others have said, we think this legislation represents an opportunity to move away from the fraught current system toward one that provides long-term certainty, stability, and consistency. And we're really hopeful that the passage of this legislation leads to more support for local, in local communities for solar projects. So I assume there aren't questions because we need to move quickly, but thank you for your time and the opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. We appreciate you being here today. Next, we would have Rep. Tisdale, who opposes the bill. Thank you, Represent or, uh, Chair Neely, Vice Chairs Farhat and uh, Van Workum and, and, and the rest of the committee. Uh, for my uh, 
describe my opposition to House Bill 4317. On behalf of the principal caucus, Representatives Beeson, Merriman, Fink, Martin, and our senior advisor, Julie Kelly. House Bill 4317 creates a solar facilities utility personal property tax exemption for a minimum of two megawatts of installed nameplate capacity. And those last two words, nameplate capacity, are very important. It replaces the utilities PPT with a payment in lieu of tax, but that in lieu of what is what has yet to be answered. To date, the taxable value of two megawatts of installed capacity solar panels and required ancillary co co uh, equipment has not been communicated to us. Additionally, it's been very uh, difficult to estimate the amount of land required for this, and today we were told it'd be somewhere between 250,000 and 350,000 acres. What we have been and will continue to be told repeatedly is that solar installations uh, produce clean energy that is creating electricity from solar arrays, and it's less expensive than fossil fuels. First, producing electricity from solar panels cannot be less expensive than fossil fuels because the two have to run concurrently. You need fossil fuel backup, so solar is incremental to fossil fuel, so it can't be less expensive. Uh, 24-7, 365 backup with fossil fuels. Second, we've been told that this is clean energy. This is also not true. To manufacture one ton of metallurgical grade silicon, you, you need uh, to burn, you, well, you need 2.8 2 tons of quartz, you need to burn 1.4 tons of coal, and 2.4 tons of wood chips. So for every one megawatt, and remember it's a two megawatt minimum, uh, for this tax exemption, you produce about 100, uh, uh, 1.4 tons of toxic waste. Every one megawatt of solar panels uses 2,868 tons of water. Every one megawatt of solar panels produces 8.1 tons of perfluorinated compounds, and I can give you the list, but these are thousands of times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. So for every one megawatt, we are essentially re releasing 16,000 tons of CO2 equivalent greenhouse gas. On top of that, consider that Michigan is 42nd in state sunlight. We average four peak sun hours per day, and we have 71 clear sky days like today. When you run the math on that, the nameplate capacity, that two, point, uh, that two, two megawatts, minimum is running at capacity three and a quarter percent of the year. Chair Neely, fellow committee members, uh, HB 47, 4317 creates more questions than it answers. I'm encouraging a no vote from my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next we will have Julie Allen from Michigan Township Association. Thank you for being here. You can start. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Appreciate the opportunity. Judy Allen with Michigan Townships Association. Um, I don't want to reiterate a lot of what was said, but I can tell you that uh, when these bills were originally introduced in 2019, 2020, um, it, was, it was 2020. It was 1105 and 1106 in the Senate. Uh, Senator Vanderwall was the sponsor at that time. The, bills, the, bill was, the main bill was six pages. We are now at 17 pages in the substitute that's before you today in the bill that was introduced. So you can see there were a lot of differences. Um, the one in 2020 mandated it. It wasn't an option. So we obviously had opposed it. Uh, it also, the data that uh, it was utilized in this process was not available at that time because Treasury was also in the process of gathering data. And it wasn't really clear on like the PPT and the land values, uh, the, it, the definitions uh, were not good in here. So again, we had these bills introduced in the Senate again last session, and now we have them this time. And I will say, like I said, there have been a lot of changes. Uh, the big, one of the big things for local units, and again, I'm, MTA is neutral on these bills, uh, is that it's, it is optional. 
that local unit has the ability to determine whether or not they wish to participate. The bills also are, provide a lot more definitions and provisions uh, in terms of addition of other equipment. That was a big issue, especially with large-scale solar facility batteries, if they were added. Uh, and it deals with a lot of things that you've also heard about abandonment, non-payment, decommissioning, et cetera. So I would say these bills are an incentive for the solar industry, as they've stated, because of the tax liability. From the local perspective, we have gotten to a point where we can be neutral. Uh, we are no longer opposed to what was there because it maintains that optionality for that local unit. Uh, it does give us, uh, it's likely for many of my members going to be a small amount of revenue, simply because if you take a very rural area with large areas of land is what they're probably going to be looking at per the industry's conversations, you may have that local unit levy a mill with a rollback that might be 0.91 or 0.85. So when you look at the overall economic benefit or financial benefit, it is not going to be for that host community specifically. It will give them the stability in terms of not having appeals. And so they have to balance that with looking at the state tax commission multiplier tables or looking at this pill and not having to have appeal issues that we experienced many, many times over with the wind. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions um, and move on so others can testify. Okay, we have one quick question from uh, Rep. Britzy. Thank you, I promise it's quick. Um, I have concerns about the dollar amount. It doesn't seem adequate to me. Do you think the $7,000 per me megawatt is an adequate amount for the locals? I'm probably not the best person on this work group to ask, answer that question. Um, we had advocated for a higher level of uh, per name plate capacity. What, what was that level? Uh, we, again, we looked at the balance between the number of years. That had a lot to do with it, whether we ranged anywhere from 15 years to 30 to 35 years. Uh, we were originally asking for something that was anywhere around the nine, ten thousand. 10,000. Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, Hiriana Richards from MML. Good afternoon, members of the committee, Chair Neely and others. Um, my name is Harrisana Richards, and I am with the Michigan Municipal League today. Um, I will be quick, um, especially because Judy covered you know, the history of the work group, but as well during 2019 and uh, 2019 and 2020, the League also did oppose these bills initially for many of the same reasons that Judy just previously laid out. Um, lots of concerns about the lack of optionality. Was the rate, you know, reflective of what we were looking for or what we were doing in this space? Um, and just many of other things. And I think Judy, you know, very well talked about the comprehensiveness of the issue and how we think now with the bills as introduced to this committee, truly the work has been done. And so many thanks to Governor Whitmer and the team everyone who was involved in the work group process because this was comprehensive. You know, a lot of this work did precede my time in the work group, but then again, it's really good. And as the league, we are a partner to see the advancement and the growth of solar in our state. Uh, that being said, today we're neutral to the bills. You know, again, we've seen the work being done, the mechanisms line up, there were improvements in timelines and structure, especially around enforcement in the case that the PILT is not paid. Um, though this has been an issue that has come up over many years, and so we've done some cyclical review as an organization. And so the one outstanding point that really defines our neutrality on the bill right now is the reduced rate. For context, MML is cities and villages, and so we have communities that are either already built out at cities or villages with le much less area. So when we look at that reduced rate and we look at how brownfields, in particular, for example, can be extensive in size, if all of these projects are at the two megawatt rate, there is some concerns about $2,000 per megawatt capacity being, you know, enough. You know, Representative Brixie, you talked about the PILT altogether. You know, that is a reduced rate that we need to consider. And, you know, the question for our folks, and I would say optionality is super important, weighing that decision of when we look at these areas that are non-traditional, but in, in each individuality very unique, are we provided with the revenue to make the other nece necessary adjustments to really sustain this viably? Um, that's a question that we have outstanding, but otherwise, you know, we have seen where this bill has started and where it's come today, and we are very appreciative to Ben in that work group and to really do a meaningful job on this that sets a precedent for years to come. And I'll leave my testimony at that and happy to answer any questions offline. Thank you. 
Seeing there's no other questions, thank you so much for your testimony today. We appreciate you. And last but not least, we have Mike from Michigan Chamber of Commerce. Afternoon, committee members. Uh, thanks for the time today. I'll keep my comments very brief. Um, uh, Michigan Chamber has 5,000 business and organization members throughout the state. Uh, very, very diverse uh, group of folks representing every industry and sector in Michigan. Uh, as my role as Director of Environmental and Energy Affairs for the Michigan Chamber, I staff our Energy Environment Committee, which is our largest committee that's built of over 350 uh, chamber members um, that represent uh, every aspect of that energy and environment space. We certainly have a lot of uh, uh, renewable uh, and energy developers, um, and you saw it, uh, Ms. Stallings uh, testified earlier today, was a member of ours. Um, we have utilities, we have a lot of energy customers, uh, particularly um, energy intensive uh, industries in the manufacturing and automotive space um, that, you know, want access to clean, affordable, and reliable energy. And increasingly what I'm hearing from my members is that, you know, they're under a number of, of different pressures, whether it's from shareholders or regulatory pressures or global comp competitiveness pressures or otherwise to be able to reduce their emissions footprint, reduce their carbon intensity. And so uh, the ability to competitively access lower carbon intensive electrons is, is a key way of doing that. And so um, that is why I'm here today. Uh, we have our membership that is um, asking for uh, the legislature to look at um, current regulatory barriers to uh, you know, uh, our, our clean energy transition. So um, I think you know, we've, we've, we've talked about a lot of different kind of areas around these issues, but I think at the end of the day, this bill is a good, these bills are good middle ground between stakeholders uh, representing industry, uh, locals, um, et cetera, and uh, would, would urge your support on the bills. So I'll just leave it at that. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. We appreciate you. Uh, we do have a couple of questions for the Department of Treasury. If Amanda, would you mind coming up for us, please? Thank you for being here today. Thanks for inviting us on. Uh, Rep. Brixie. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, my first question would be, um, so since this is a PILT, is it a PILT that's only for the personal property as aspect of it, or what about the real property aspect of it, if it's in a, um, like a, um, farm field as opposed to, you know, a parking lot. The definition uh, in the, in the uh, bill has the, it's a personal property and it does not, ex it excludes the, the land. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is, what's the difference in terms of today's existing depreciation tables um, versus the PILTs, what's, what's the difference in um, revenue towards uh, local communities and schools and everybody else who's, you know, on that? And how is the distribution handled? So the multiplier table for solar energy systems is form 5762 and it, and it provides that after 12 years the solar facility uh, uh, true cash value is 12% of the original cost. Okay, so how are the how are the school how are the school millages handled? So in in 
the personal property, if there's special millages in the school, like who, how is the PILT divvied up? Who agrees on who gets what? Uh, currently, the solar facilities are assessed and taxed as industrial personal property. Oh, it's industrial. Okay. So they're exempt from yeah, school sorry. operating millage and the, and the state education tax, okay. but do pay other school millages like debt or sinking fund. So how does that get divvied up when it's different than uh, just the, the, the pilt would be distributed just like just like the the, tax the industrial bill. personal property tax based on the millage rates levied. Okay. So the losses to each local government are going to be dependent on what their millage rates are. Uh, losses or gains, that's correct. All right, thank you, Rep. Britsey. Rep. Price? I'm sorry for the confusion, Chair Neely. My question's actually for DTE and consumers. Okay, that's not a problem. Do we have um, DTE and consumers still here? Uh, you guys can go ahead. Yes. Oh, one moment. We have one more question from uh, Rep. Carter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And uh, my, my question is pretty much along the same lines as Rep. Brixey. What kind of fiscal impact would this have on communities that are that's struggling? In other words, if an underserved community opts in for this, this legislation, would it have any negative impact on these communities, especially if they're not able to, I'm assuming, pay? I, what do you mean if they're not assuming if if you're saying that the utility wasn't able to pay the fee or or the, I'm understanding that this is uh, something that local communities have to uh, opt in or opt out okay so if they opt in and they can't meet their end of the agreement is there are there negative uh, repercussions for that for them not understanding I'm trying to understand your question. If a, if a local community opts in, mm -hmm. and, and they are and they not able an agreement, to, right, and they're not able to up, uphold that agreement for whatever reason. The local community would be, it's, it's the company that's coming in to put the solar in mm -hmm. is going to be paying the local community. The local community just needs to provide the, the services that they normally would. Okay, so I'm understanding you saying that there would be no negative impact for a local community. Correct. Okay, that's what I'm asking in an indirect way. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you so much for asking those questions for us. Can we have, um, do we have anyone from Consumer Energy? Okay. Brett Price. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chair Neely, and for your leadership um, bringing this before us. I'm thrilled to see something that can promote um, community or that can promote solar projects. I think this is fantastic. Um, but my question, and I think DTE and consumers are the best way for me to direct my question, as as the state of Michigan, as we look to build out a more clean energy future. Um, Shouldn't we also be encouraging households and smaller businesses to be able to take advantage of these opportunities to do rooftop and community solar projects so that they can have um, the same benefits that we're looking to give the state and these larger uh, developers? My question is, as large-scale companies and, and producers reap the benefits of these projects, including, as we know, there will be a capture of federal IRA dollars with these projects, shouldn't everyday Michiganders be able to do the same? Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I don't know that the PILT um, changes that. Obviously, the, the two megawatt limitation is a, um, I mean, the, the stakeholder group kind of set that as the, the minimum floor for the actual PILT uh, payment. But the, um, you know, as, as you said, the Inflation Reduction Act provides benefits to both large scale and rooftop and community solar uh, projects. Um, and then even within the state of Michigan, the, our traditional property tax system still has a mechanism to tax um, 
those projects that are under the two megawatts. And, and the, the STC has issued guidance on those that even from a, um, even from a traditional ad valorem perspective, those projects are not using the large scale solar table. They're, they're actually using, um, it, it's a, uh, it's a more generic machinery and equipment table that, that depreciates actually pretty quickly uh, in year one down to, down to year 15. And then I think again, as we're looking to do this for the large scale producers and um, investors in, in this form, um, I just want to, I know that we're not directly addressing it here, but our cap on uh, solar energy that we have for households and community solar, just advocate for ending that so that our, our smaller everyday Michiganders can reap some of the same benefits and contribute to our overall goal for having a clean energy future here in Michigan. That's all, thank you. Okay, thank you so much. And with our time, we're gonna have to wrap up. So thank you so much for being here with us. I'm gonna read in some cards. Um, we have um, America Clean Power Association, not wishing to speak, but support the bill. AES Clean Energy, support the bill. Uh, Michigan Lead and Conversation Voters, support the bill. Michigan Environmental Council uh, support the bill and Clean Grid Alliance uh, support the bill. Now we have Rep Grant offer the substitute on H1 to House Bill 4317. Thank you, Chairwoman Neely. I have the substitute H1 for House Bill 4317. This substitute is a collaborative request on behalf of locals, the energy companies, and Treasury. The sub will allow locals 120 days instead of 90 for local units to process requests for solar districts and assessments. It will clarify how on-site assets, new or replaced, are annually identified as requested by local stakeholders, and it removes a requirement mandating local governments to provide copies of resolutions by certified mail to the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, please call the vote. On the motion to adopt the substitute, Chair Neely? Yes. Representative Sparhaf? Yes. Rixie? Are we voting on this bill? No. Just the sub. Yes, on the sub. I'm so sorry. Carter? Yes. Witsett? Grant? Yes. Price? Yes. Van Workham? Yes. Markinen? Yes. Altman? Yes. Tisdale? Yes. Holdley? Yes. Madam Chair, you have nine yeas, zero nays, two pass. The substitute is adopted. Thank you. Representative Carter makes a motion to excuse um, absent members. Without an ejection, absent members are excused. There being no further business before this, commu uh, this committee, this committee stands adjourned. <laughs>